your host, Richard Atherton. I'm delighted to welcome Johanna Rothman, author of 14 books and counting. Yes. Across project management, hiring and, and fiction. Well, yes. In fact, the fiction is is brand new. I just had a story published. I have not even sent email to my email list. Um, it just came out over the weekend. So I'm just so excited. I can't stand it. And what's the story? What's the... Uh, the oh, new- that's a science fiction story. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I know. I know. Well, I'm a big reader, as you can tell. Yeah, and, yeah. So for those listening, that, there's a huge bookshelf. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and you you cannot see my electronic books. Right. So, yeah. And actually that well, this leads into the first question. What's uh of all of the books which are you most proud of and why? <laughs> Oh, see, this is like asking about your favorite child. I don't know if you have children. I have two two. grown children. Okay, so mine are are adult and one just got married. So I I kind of almost have another child, a son-in-law is a child, not not a child. But I have, I take great pride in their accomplishments. And I, it's always the most recent book that I'm proudest of because I have evolved my writing. I've evolved how I tell the story because even a nonfiction book is telling a story and I've evolved my audiences, right? So not every book is right for every single audience. So I have, I have a hard time answering that question. Um, so yeah, I, I really, I like the one I'm on now. Okay. Well, so let's say, so what, so, I know we'll talk. We'll talk all about magic management and agile and, and all the rest of it. But I'm fascinated. So the size, this is the one you're most proud of. What's What's the story of the science fiction book? Then can you give us a price? Oh, so the science fiction. So this is a short story. It's not okay. a book. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is about a being that looks kind of like a yeti and is on another planet, and she can walk on the snow and not leave tracks, and she. She helps rescue um, a guy, because I thought it might be a romance, but it's not really a romance. Um, A guy who crashed, and she saves him, and then his people are, when they come to get him, are afraid of her. So they shoot her. Not dead. No. I'm all about the happily ever after. So not dead. But she's very disdainful of these idiots. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So... You know, who's really the most um, mature and alien civilization is really the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, what are competing civilizations? Yeah. I mean, they're not, well, they don't have to be com- competing, but certainly Different. the, yeah, certainly the, the people who have all the machines think that they're more civilized. But that may not be true. It might not be true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, I just was watching the Netflix. Uh, I was watching the Netflix documentary uh, about the Naga yogis, right? These naked yogis in India who completely reject all worldly possessions, even clothes, right? They're, they're naked wandering around. And uh, yeah, a lot of, it seems to be a lot of wisdom in what. Yeah, well, well, their message. And, I think um, I really like clothes. I'm I'm cold <laughs> too much of the time. Yeah, so I mean, I'm wearing a sweater. It's going to be 80 degrees out here. Oh, what is that in Celsius? Um, high 20s. Right. Later on, and I still have a sweater. So yeah. Not much uh, chance of you becoming a, a naked. No, shaking. no. Uh, let me just say this now: not a chance ever ever at all no not a chance that's 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 good doesn't doesn't call all of us <laughs> yeah great um so yeah so i i uh i do a lot of my work in helping businesses and uh, coaching business and a lot of the time especially right now the conversation is around how do we become more agile and you've done a ton of writing on that right 
Um, and, and, and I was prepared for this and thinking, you know, where, well, where do we start with that? Because it's, it's A, it's a huge topic, and B, you've written a, a lot on it. And <laughs> certainly I didn't have the bandwidth to read all of your works in that topic. So I would not expect so. <laughs> that so, would be crazy, yeah. yeah. And so maybe it's just, maybe it's useful to start, because some people will, you know, maybe coming across, even that term for the first time, they might be like, oh, you know, agile does that mean and may not realize it has a sort of a sort of a, you know a special meaning if you like in in the business context so maybe we should start there in terms of like how, what do you how do you define it or how do you summarize it uh and yeah what what what's it, what are your main messages for businesses trying to take it on so i think of agile as a way to release what you want when you want to whom you want and that means you need teams across the organization. You need a, a cross-functional team to actually do the technical work if you're talking about a, a technical feature. If you're talking about the project portfolio, you need a team of managers to talk about what is first, second, and third. So we can do something and then change to do something else. Um, and they... They have to they have to be an agile team also if you're talking about a program which is a collection of projects with one business objective then you need to coordinate the efforts across the entire organization so that they can understand how do we release what can change so when releasing it's about doing something small so you can go back and, and get the next thing, whatever the next thing is. And I think that that's, that's really the important message. The Agile Manifesto was about software development, and that's, it was a great place to start. I think it's, as far as I'm concerned, the principles behind the manifesto work for almost every company. I have not yet found an organization for which they do not work. So I really start with those principles. And then how do we get people collaborating across the organization so we can deliver what we want, when we want, to whom we want? And, and yeah, I mean, you know, go back and, and look at the manifesto, go back and look at the principles. But for me, that really encapsulates it. Okay. What we want, when we want, to who we want, which... Um, yeah. Right. Which I guess sounds simple, but is, is so hard, right? Especially the when we want it. Especially the when oh, we want it. So, so this is really the problem. For so long, all these knowledge work managers were told, divide up the work, right? Divide and conquer, as if it's a manufacturing process. And knowledge work is a learning process not a manufacturing process and changing that mindset oh my goodness so that's where we got resource efficiency from manufacturing which totally makes sense for manufacturing when you're doing the same thing again and again and again in software we don't do the same thing we rarely do it twice <laughs> never mind again and again and again so how can we estimate what we have to do that's really a difficult problem. How can we make sure we actually do what the customer wants? That's why you want shorter feedback loops. And that's why you need to know who the customer is, right? So in, for the project portfolio, the customer is the rest of the organization. For a team, the customer might be a person down the hall or um, in B2B, customers all over the world or um, mass market, a mass market product, you know, might even, you might not even know who your customers are, but they are everywhere. So I think it's really important to say, how can we think about our work products? How can we collaborate? How can we get to flow efficiency so we learn as we go, as opposed to resource efficiency? And I'm I'm beginning to think that for managers, that is the first place to think. That's it. So it's going for, to flow efficiency from resource efficiency. Yes. And all of the management metrics, all of these KPIs, all of everything that they do to manage performance, 
manage performance. When was the last time you needed your performance managed? Right. Maybe, in a, a, no, if you ever took dance classes, yeah, your performance needed to be managed. And if you took acting classes, your performance needed to be managed. Not at work. We don't have to manage performance at work, especially in a, if we're on a collaborative team. The team manages its own performance. So I think that all the ways we talk about people at work is just so wrong. Well, well, okay. So let's unpack that a bit because I'm sure there'll be some people listening and saying, "Well, no, hang on. You know, we we do need to manage performance. You know, it's important that a an actor who's not getting his lines right is given some feedback and improves their their acting performance, and, and a developer who's screwing up the code for for whatever reason, you know, that they, they need their performance. I mean, doesn't that isn't that still a requirement in T? Um, no. So you you said that magic word feedback. Everybody needs feedback, right? So we before we started, we gave each other a little feedback. I asked about my hair. Did it look kind of crazy? We looked at at the speakers and the video. We made we made sure to do a lots of little feedback in what the two or three minutes before we started, and. You will give me feedback if something happens during this episode, right? I mean, you will. You will give me feedback. And I will, I might give you feedback. I don't know. We're, we're kind of in the moment, so we don't really have to. But every single one of your questions to me is a form of feedback about my previous answer. We are doing continual feedback in this conversation. When teams work as collaborative teams, the team gives each other feedback all the time. This is one of the reasons I really like pairing, swarming, and mobbing, because it, it invites feedback. If you, if you are a manager, you often don't know what the people on your team are doing in the day-to-day -day moments. So you don't know that somebody is facilitating the work of five other people. It looks as if this developer isn't doing anything. But this developer is coaching, is mentoring, is providing feedback about the code and test, even if they did not write a line of code. Is that more valuable or less valuable? Mostly it's more valuable. Sometimes it's less valuable. So managers really cannot know what team members are doing. Even, even back in Waterfall, we really didn't know. Right. So, and especially if we want uh, collaborative cross-functional teams in an agile organization, we don't know what the, what the people are doing. So we need to equip the teams with their own tools to manage their their reactions to each other and to manage the work product. And that's feedback. It's coaching. It's one-on-ones. It's all the stuff that managers alone used to do, but now we need people in the teams who do them very well right and that's the shift that's the shift okay and uh, so this is this is interesting because if you take that word away from me performance it's it, it, it creates a challenge in my mind because i'm like well okay if well if we're not managing performance then is and yet i have an intuition that maybe some in my team we might say isn't pulling their weight or isn't up to the job what what how do i deal with that tension what so my question to you is do you need to deal with it with that tension and can you gather any data to ask yourself is my intuition right so you might ask the team i am worried about your ability um, as a team to work together. You might ask various people, um, how are you working together as a team? Because managers still need one-on-ones, right? They still need to provide um, meta feedback and meta coaching, because uh, I will freely admit this, I did not get into software because I am a people person. I got into software to commune with the computer and it is the greatest irony of my life that I am now a people person because that's not where I come from. I don't come from, I love people. I get up in the morning and I want to be with people. No, I don't. I don't. 
I come up, I wake up in the morning and say, how can I help people intellectually create great products and ship them? That's where I come from. So call me Spock. I am a Spock-like person. I am not, um, who is a good example of a really human person? I don't know. Um, I don't even see that stuff. So, so I think it's really, but I was a very successful manager because I recognized that while I was not a people person, managing people's interactions, creating the environment that they needed to use to have the best possible interactions, that was my job as a manager. Right. So managers create the culture, they refine the culture, they create that great environment in which people can do great work. That's what managers do. And creating a feeling of transparency and openness. I don't know how open your team needs to be, but um, the more open they are with each other and the more they work together, the better off they are as a team, the better off the product will be and the more insight everybody has on how people are working together. So I'm saying um, it's not just one-way communication up and down between one manager and one subordinate. Instead, it's communication across the team and many networks of communication up to the manager. All right. And it's got to be data-focused. Okay. So it's all about getting getting the feedback. And you talked about meta coaching. And by that, do you mean coaching Co with the team? Coaching about the coaching, coaching about the, uh, well, so imagine I'm on a team and let me just, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story from back when I was a tester. There was another tester on my team who was not coming into work on time. As far as I can tell, he wasn't doing anything. Uh, I was I was supporting the development team by myself as a tester. And I didn't like this very much. So I went to my boss and said, I don't know how to give this guy feedback, right? Dennis is not doing what he needs to do. I don't know how to give him feedback. I would like you to give him feedback. And my boss actually was very smart. He said, I, I don't want to be the conduit for feedback between you and Dennis. I will facilitate the conversation between you and Dennis. So come with your data, right? And so I said, how far back should this data go? He said, Johanna, last week, don't go the last three months. That's just stupid, right? He can't do anything about that. But last week or these past few days in preparation for the next week, that's useful. So I said, so we had a meeting in the conference room. Look, my boss was actually very smart about this. Dennis and I sat on other on opposite sides of the table because I was so angry at him by this time. And my boss sat at, at one end, right? So he was not taking sides. This is really important. And he said, okay, Johanna, start with your data. What are you concerned about? So I said, I have concerns about this piece and this piece and this piece. I feel as if I'm doing all the testing. I have no idea what you're doing. And that's when Dennis said, oh, here are the tools I wrote that I've been checking out with this one developer. And I've actually been doing a ton of work. And he was pairing with a developer. I was not quite pairing with the other three developers. And I his work was not transparent to me. So I had no idea what he was doing. He was actually doing a great job, right? So I had, I was convinced he was a moron. I'd already labeled him a moron because I had not supplied him the data. His work was not transparent to me. So I did not realize what he was doing. And he was paving the way for all of us to proceed in another month or two down the road. I would have chosen different work for him to do at the at this initial time. And so we talked about that. Was it worthwhile doing all that work in preparation? And some of it was and some of it wasn't. But that's where we get all tied up in our shorts about how do we create an opportunity for this conversation? How do, what do we say in this conversation? And how do we start with the data as opposed to our conclusions? 
I, I had already decided this guy was a moron. Right. So, so this is where managers can really help. And if I had, if I had just gone to my manager and said, Dennis is not delivering, my manager actually had data to know that Dennis was delivering. But how could I tell? What did we need to do in the in the team environment, in the project environment? Mm, and that would have been an example of resource efficiency. You know, this resource, yeah. this person, isn't being efficient. And so we need well, to fix and, this. And he was working alone, right? He mm. and I were not working together. We were not attacking the testing problem for this product together. We were each doing our own thing. So if we were working on flow efficiency, if we said, how do we get everyone on this team to deliver something this week together, now, now we have a different problem. Right. Yeah, okay. And and what does that mean from a from a leadership perspective? What do you think that means uh, for people developing their leadership qualities? So, I think that when you develop your leadership qualities, it's all about how easy is it for you to create to to offer feedback to a person. How easy is it for you to take feedback from a person? How, have you grown your coaching capabilities? All of those things. And it, it really means for managers that they stop micromanaging. So instead of a manager estimating on behalf of a team, the team estimates. Instead of a manager asking, what are your things? What are your things? What are your things? The team creates their list of work and they take the work piece by piece as they proceed. This is a really different approach for managers. So many managers think that the job of a first line manager is to get in there and work with the code or work with the tests or tell people what to do. I don't see it that way. And I certainly don't see mid-level managers or senior managers doing it that way either. So mm. it's a it's a really different approach to seeing how how do we work together as a team to make this work? Right. So to understand that bit, well, certainly what was interesting and stood out for me there was it's one of the first things you said was it's our ability to give feedback and our ability to take feedback. Right? And that, that's an interesting <laughs> idea because that speaks to something about self-work, at least in my mind, and self-development and reflection as an individual. So the very first time, so I'd been working um, for about a couple years by the time I really got a worthwhile um, piece of feedback in a, in a performance review, right? So I had a performance review in my first job and my very first job, they underpaid me and I discovered this by mistake. I was not looking for relative pay scales and I had gotten this gigantic raise um, I'm old, as you can tell. So I started to work in 1977. And in 1978, I got a something like a 15 or 16% raise. It was gigantic. I know, I know, it was really big. And my, my colleague, a guy who had started to work literally the same day as I did, but did not have the same language experience, had not worked as a team, did not have a BS in computer science, all these stuff that I had had actually started at a higher pay rate. I did not know this. And he said, I only got a 10% raise. I said, oh, what are you making? And he said, 17 something or other. I was making 16,500. Right, $16, this is back in 1978. So it was good pay back then. Yeah. But it was, and he was still making more money. So I went to my boss and I said, why is so-and-so making more money? He said he came in at a higher pay rate. I said, I do better work than he does. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not known for being shy. Um, and I, have, I had many more qualifications. Why am I not being paid exactly what he's being paid? And he said, my boss said, I gave you the maximum pay raise that HR will take. 
HR will not allow me to give you real pay parity. I have to wait for another year. So I said, why, why do I have to wait for another year? He said, I can't do it. So I had gotten no useful feedback about my, about my work and I was underpaid. So I found a new job. I mean, why not? Right. And in the very first, um, uh, performance review I got for that first job, the next job, my boss said to me, you have trouble finishing things. And I said, oh, this last project that I just finished, he said, no, the one nine months ago and the one six months ago and the one three months ago and the one last week. And I said, why did you wait so long? I could have finished all these things. You would have been happier with me. Why did you wait so long? He said, I thought I had to wait until the performance review. And I said, here's the deal. You don't have to wait for the performance review to tell me I'm doing something wrong. And I will take feedback from you anytime about anything at all. He said, that's a deal. So that's when, and I did not realize that that was a powerful thing, right? To be able to take feedback. And because this feedback was so useful. I use that feedback to this very day because I really hate finishing. I get it 90% done, 98% done, 99% done. And so those last little I's and T's, ugh, irritating. So for me, that, that feedback was so valuable. It changed the course of my career. Why wouldn't I want it? Hmm. So that, and, and, and that, well, I suppose that ties into your earlier point about learning. That, that helps you to learn about yourself taking that feedback and that ability mm -hmm. to say that feedback. But something you said that interested me, you said that you did better work than this guy. Well, isn't that the, the other paradigm where you're comparing yourself as a resource versus him as a resource? I mean, doesn't that speak to an intuition that we do have, that people are just better at some jobs than other people, right? And it's... So this was, this was a very long time ago, and it was a waterfall project actually a, a waterfall program. And he was not, he did not have the same initiative I had to go out and, excuse me, and figure things out and talk to people. He waited until people came to him. So everything for him was an emergency. And everything for me kind of flowed, right? So I really don't like emergencies. Right? Your lack of planning does not create an emergency for me. And when, when my boss, my boss had actually talked about that and he said, but he recovers so well from emergencies. And I said, and how many emergencies have I had in the last year? And he said, uh, none. I said, no, I had one in March. I had one. I did, because I don't like emergencies. I would much rather just go and do my work. And the more we do individual performance, the more emergencies and firefighting we have, because we're comparing what we think are the outputs of other people as opposed to the outcomes. And this, this business of output versus outcome is something I'm really struggling with in terms of how to talk about it. So an output is firefighting. An output is finishing the development and testing. An, out, an output is all that stuff. But the outcome of smooth delivery for a team, that should be, in my opinion, at a higher level than firefighting. Right, Because if a team can figure out how to smoothly develop and deliver and know that what they have is good, they will have much less firefighting than they ever needed. So what are you really rewarding in the organization? Are you rewarding the outputs of firefighting or the outcomes of smooth development through a team? Mm. Okay, but then to stick on this point a little bit, so are you saying that it's okay to judge an individual's perform or whatever what behaviors, let's say, in the context of their contribution or otherwise to the flow of the team? Like, that's okay. Are you saying there's a special case? 
So I think so. And the team often knows that, right? So my team on this project knew what I delivered. And they also knew what this other guy delivered and didn't deliver. So the team actually knows. It's very hard for a manager to know. But the team, the team always knows. Mm. Okay. So what do we, so okay, so that's, so, so where I'm going to, okay, so what, do, what does that tell us? for managers and it is it something about you know it goes both back to something you said is getting data from the team data about so, the team so let's talk a little bit about okrs right objectives and key results because that's let's hope that we stop having mbos management by objectives i see way too many okrs that look exactly like mbos so if we have a corporate objective of delivering this particular product then the team has an objective of how easily we can flow work through our team to deliver this product. As soon as you change that OKR to, um, and the team will have a certain velocity, which is an idiotic measure, and because velocity is a current measure of capacity based on the environment of the code and the tests and what the team knows about the domain, right? So it, a velocity measure is silly in the extreme sorry all you people who love velocity and if you have if you have an okr that's for a person that is directly that's an mbo right so if if my objective was finish this project without all the other people on my team having the same objective then we are down to resource efficiency again. We're dividing and conquering as opposed to thinking about the whole. So when I think about um, how people contribute, I wanna always optimize up. If I'm a person on a team, how do we optimize up for the team? If I'm a team on a program, how do we optimize up for the program? If I'm a product owner, how do we optimize up for the entire product? If I'm a middle manager, how do we create a project portfolio that enables us to succeed in the marketplace rather than my people getting funding? So it's always this optimize up. And I already forgot your question, which is why I wanted to talk about optimize up. So yeah, we're- No, but, we're, but I get that. Oh. And actually before we, before we just, as we should just clarify for people who don't know what objectives and key results are or OKRs, it's a, it's a special type of objective setting, right? Where you you separate very clearly the qualitative objective and the quantitative results. You make the objective big and inspiring and heartfelt, and you make the results difficult but not impossible, inspiring, stretch or stretching results. And and you might have key results where people do not achieve even half of the key results in a given quarter often OKRs are quarterly, and people might only be able to achieve anywhere from 20 to maybe 25 to 75% of those key results. Whereas with MBOs, management by objectives, we were supposed to achieve all of the objectives at the end of whatever um, period that was, yeah. often a year. And you're saying that they should always be held at the team, whatever your team is, it should yes. be held at the team level. Yes. Because otherwise they're they're MBOs again, right? And you've and, well, it's, this looks to something you wrote in your uh, one of your books about the tyranny of the board, where you start putting individual names against. Well, in that case, it was a particular task, perhaps, or an objective on a board, or a story, let's say, on a board. But it the same would apply for for objectives and key results. I'm guessing the same. Yes, and and with a board, that's often about the experts, right? So. Um, I'm an expert in this and I'm an expert in that. And if you only have the experts take their expertise, first of all, they don't learn about anything else. And you have insufficient resilience in the team because nobody else is learning from the experts, right? So the experts reinforce their, their expertise. Everyone else reinforces their expertise and there's no Venn diagram how do you do a Venn diagram on a, on a video? There's no Venn diagram of overlap. Hmm. 
something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, but yeah, and I, and I can imagine there's a lot of visceral reaction to that to say, okay, I get the principle, but we need, we need somebody on the line for this, right? You know, we need somebody's head on the block. You know, we need someone to feel the pressure. So that's about blame. And so instead of a person, what if you said, let's have this team do it. And then you said to the team, here are some options for how you could work. You could pair, you could swarm, you could mob, but your objective as a team is to finish this thing. This thing is so valuable to the company that we are assigning an entire team to it. This is, this is the change of perspective. So, so many managers are used to slicing and dicing their time to achieve multiple objectives that they forget or they don't know that technical teams need one objective and the team works to achieve that objective because they need deep focus time. Managers actually re need deep focus time too, but that's a subject of a uh, book, at least two books away. So I, I'm working very slowly on my agile management book because I, I need the words to talk about this. And if you want someone's head on a block, create a servant leader who is responsible to the team to facilitate their work and to create an environment in which they can be successful that person could be a scrum master. I prefer the term agile project manager. You might have a coach, uh, whatever, whatever that team needs, because that team will have so many impediments to finishing the work, mostly because of management interruption. So if the if this work is really important that you need to blame somebody for it, then you need to give that team the work help them realize what environment they need, help them realize how they can work, and then step away. Stop interfering with the team. And if you have 15 things that are all number one, you have nothing that is number one. And right. that's, that's really the part that management has a hard time with because they feel the pressure, right? The system creates pressure on managers to say everything is number one, they don't feel safe to say no. And that means that teams don't feel safe to say no either. Hmm. So give the team one object objective and give the team a coach or a, a somebody who's responsible to remove impediments and perhaps protect the team to focus on that one thing. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That makes some sense. Um, and why don't you like the word, I know you've written in your book, you don't like the word scrum master, or you don't like titles like chief and so on. What's, what's the reaction, Ella? So, I mean, honestly, who is the master of you or me? Um, I could talk about romance novels in this, in this um, piece, <laughs> but I won't. Um, I don't have to. any, my, I don't, I have a colleague, I have a partnership with my husband, He's not the master of me. I'm not the master of him. When my children were small, um, I, I remember distinctly my younger daughter saying, you're not the boss of me when she was three years old. And at the time I kind of was because she was three. But we don't have masters at work and we don't have Ubers and we don't have chiefs and we don't have, I mean, all of that implies a hierarchy. And for me, agile approaches are so team-based and so network-based that the minute we introduce a hierarchy, we lose some agility. And so I think you're talking about the program management book when you said- I, mean, I that actually read that, the, 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 creating a successful agile project. Oh, yeah. I might've said it there also. I really hate this master business um, and Ubers and chiefs and stuff. So, cause it's, so there might be the the product champion, right? And there might be the chief product owner, but I think that that person is a product manager. And I don't I don't understand this. Our words matter, right? When we start to, to talk about masters and chiefs and Ubers, we we say 
there's someone in charge. That person has all their responsibility. You don't have to, you poor little developer, you poor little tester, you don't have to take any responsibility because this master will take responsibility. This Uber, this chief, I mean, maybe I have a little Napoleon complex. You can't see, I'm only five feet tall. Okay, that's on a very good day. So, but I did my stretching this morning, so I might be five feet. And I don't like it when people tell me how to do my job. I really like it when they tell me, here's what I want from you. I really like obje objectives. But when anyone tries to master me, and I have that in quotes, I'm a rebellious person. And I always find at least two or three more ways it's better than the one that they said. So I am, and, and the problem with literally Scrum Master is you get it after a two-day class. You are not the master of anything after a two-day class, right? So, because mastering Scrum is not about how you do the scrum or rituals or ceremonies or whatever they're called now and how you do a stand-up. If you really want to master scrum, it's how you manage the work in process for a short time box, facilitate the team to getting it to done and reflecting and in inspecting and adapting as you go. And if you're not taking stuff from the, the lean world and you're not taking stuff from anywhere else that your team needs, you're not actually an effective scrum master. And so many people think scrum mastering is about sticking with it, excuse me, with the scrum guide, period, full stop the end, as, a, as opposed to taking in everything that Agile has to offer and lean. I think that, that that's really an issue. Right, but a friend of mine does this exercise where she'll go into a group and she'll, she'll ask, she'll ask them to identify and this is without um without reference to sort of formal titles you know who's the leader who's the leader in this room and and a hundred percent success they'll identify they'll identify the person who has the most power or is the leader in that situation i remember i went on a, a men's weekend once i've shared this story before on a podcast where we were all with none of us had met each, each other we were we were put into into groups and the instruction was choose a leader in silence and the way you do that is you all stand up and you successively sit down until the leader is chosen and every group managed to do it right we i think there's something in us as humans who kind of just get the dynamic they understand who has the most power in a given context and so for me, there's something just innate in human groups where they'll always form some kind of a hierarchy. And then whether or not we put labels on those individuals is kind of beside the point. So I have two questions. So there were no women in that men's group. No, but the other friend of mine and, does it with, with mixed groups. Yeah. And did the tallest man become the leader? No. He he wasn't. The t I don't think he was the tallest. No, he may have been. He may have been the oldest. Actually, I'm not sure. Okay, so I have some very funny stories about appointed leaders. Um, one comes from the time I was on jury duty. So, the the judge appointed the leader for us, right? The jury foreman, uh, who was the oldest man, who was actually the tallest person on the jury. And I facilitated the entire conversation in the jury. Okay, so that's a different problem. So we do often want leaders. And if they are servant leaders, those leaders are great for a team. So a servant leader helps everybody articulate the problem. They, they help everybody grow through coaching. They, they don't take the power, they offer the power. Those are the best kinds of leaders. And we need people like that on almost every team. I'm trying to think. <laughs> and you're saying those are the best type of leaders in the, the, the learning knowledge space? Yes. Not necessarily in all contexts, or are you saying in all contexts? I would have to think a lot more about if okay. it's in all contexts. Now I'm talking about 
um, leaders at work in knowledge in knowledge work because I'm not sure. So, for example, I don't do zip lines, right? I have vertigo. I don't do zip lines, so I would not be a good leader for a zip line activity. In fact, I would say I'm hanging out on the ground. So, I would I would I mean each of us can lead in different ways, and I think that that's also part of the issue. How do we create leadership for every single person on the team? So if, if I have to be free to give you fee to offer you feedback and you have to be free to offer me feedback, if we always go up through a leader and come back down, we are not free to offer and receive feedback. So the leader will create the environment in the team that people will will feel free to offer and receive feedback. Right, but they're still looking to that individual to provide some leadership in terms of creating the environment. Well, and even yes, and and even that, the, does that not constitute even if it's an informal some form of hierarchy? Um, I don't think it's hierarchy. I I guess I have to think about that. I think it depends. So let's let's use an example of a stand up. If everybody looks to the quote leader and gives them individual feedback about the status of their work, I would say, first of all, this is not an agile team. And secondly, the leader is, is encouraging serial status meetings. If instead, if instead the leader says, how do we help move this work to done, right, which is a different way of walking the board than many teams, are accustomed to and then the team says oh we could do this or i could do that or i need help with this that's a very different meeting so the leader is creating this environment in which people can bring their best selves to work right we we talk a lot about bringing your whole self to work and i have mixed feelings about your whole self i think bringing your best self to work is a measure of respect for yourself and your colleagues and the work. So I'm maybe it's maybe it's semantics. Maybe I'm just being a little wordy here, wordsmithing. No, I can see but, something in that. And like, well, what I hear in that is a critique of, you know, don't bring, you know, don't don't bring certain issues to the workplace in respect for the out of respect for the work. No, I can see the counter to that, but I can I can see a point yeah. you're making. Okay. So so I think the key is, yes, we often want leadership. The question is, does that leadership have to reside in only one person? So have you ever been part of a tiger team? Um, no, no, assuming that you don't mean literally working with tigers. No, no, no. You have a hot fix. You have a very crazy customer. You got as little time as you can possibly imagine, possibly less. And your manager brought three or four people together. They put you in a room and said, please fix this as soon as you can. There is not necessarily a leader on that team. That is truly a self-organizing, a self-managing team. So the, the organization brought you all together, but you came off of other teams. And you work together, and you might swarm on the work, you might mob on the work, you might pair on the work, but you're all working in service of this one goal. For me, that's the essence uh, of, of where leadership is in, in created among all the people on the team. I've been fortunate or unfortunate, I'm not so sure, um, and, and thinking about and being on several Tiger teams. All of them were, we needed to create a hot fix for this very hot customer, right? The customer was angry. We needed, we needed to save this the, the product for this customer. And we did not have a project manager. We did not have a formal leader. Um, I often, I, uh, we often had managers who came in every 30 minutes and I would say, I will post our status on the door, leave the door closed unless it's every two hours, in which case you can pop your head in. 
but if you interrupt us, we're not going to get the work done. And so, so I often did that because I knew about multitasking and interruptions way back when. So I think that it's really important to say, how do we, does a leader create this environment? Does the leader enable the environment? Do we actually need one person in the guise of leader or can we have leadership um, created in the entire team? And what would it take for us to do that? We might still need a nominal person to say, here's the status of the team. Here's what the team is doing. Here's, here's the progress against what we thought it would be. And, that, and you might not want one person, you might not want to rotate that role through the entire team because that's a real pin in the tush for everybody. But it's, I don't think we need as much leadership in the form of management I think we need a lot of leadership in creating the environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. And just before I've got a question there in terms of, you know, what does that look like? But actually before that, just for people who are mobbing and swarming, what for people who are oh, Okay. So swarming is when everybody on the team works on one item at a time. And if we have three developers and two testers, the developers go off and do their thing and the testers go off and do their thing and they sync up every hour or so, right? But everyone on the team is working on one thing at one time to finish this. So a tiger team is an exact, um, that's what a swarm looks like. We swarm on the work to finish the work. And if, I, if a part is done, I ask, does anybody need help? Does anybody need review? Can I offer anything to anybody on this team? Because I think that my part is done for now, right? And then people mm. will often say, please review this, please write a test for this, please develop this thing. We, we all work together as a team to finish this and we're all done when everybody is done. A mob is the same one item, but it's only one keyboard and one monitor. So everybody takes turns sitting at the keyboard. Nobody hogs the keyboard for 15 minutes. Four to five minutes is actually a really nice time. And the person at the keyboard, um, only their fingers work. I know this sounds strange. So the, the rest of the team tells them what to do, what to type, what to open. So you might say open paren, blah, 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 close paren, right? So that literally you're, you're yeah. telling the people, the person at the keyboard what to type. Right. And that's, that's the wisdom of the crowds. And it turns out that, so I have a lot of personal anecdotal experience that swarming works really, really well for almost all kinds of knowledge work that when we limit our work in progress to one thing at a time, we finish it a lot faster. That's the flow efficiency idea. Um, Woody Zool has a lot of, um, of uh, more anecdotal evidence that mobbing actually has even an increase in throughput than pairing and swarming does. And that's because the entire team learns together and if, since knowledge work is about learning to deliver and inform the next piece of work, mobbing is a really great way of learning as a team and delivering as a team, and that informs the next piece of work. Wow, I mean, that would be pretty radical, isn't it? If all teams <laughs> reduced their equipment down to one keyboard at one minute and, and did, did all of the work as one team with one machine. That's so, a broadening you know, idea. I, I think that a lot of managers were so stuck, and I include myself. I, I did not come to the mobbing as, oh, this sounds like a good idea. I actually was drag kicking and screaming into pairing in 1982. It was not one of my favorite things. It was not something I wanted and to do. And for those ever. who are not familiar with pairing, that's one keyboard, one monitor, two people. Yes, yes. Um, the two person version of mobbing. Right. And so I, it took me about a week to really become comfortable with it. I, I, I wouldn't say I was really comfortable until Esther and I pair wrote behind closed doors 
Secrets of Great Management back in 2003 and four. And I've been collaborate. I'm working with Mark Kilby. We are literally pair writing the book about geographically distributed agile teams. We are honest to God pairing, right? I, I probably grab the keyboard more often because I'm a pain in the ass. And he is, we, we trade off, we do everything as a pair. And when we, when people mob, I was not, and I thought this was such a stupid idea until I, I actually said I had one client where everybody was an expert in one little thing. They could not finish anything at all. And I said, let's do a 20 minute experiment, just 20 minutes. We're all going to sit in front of the keyboard or where I have um, in the conference room, we had one keyboard, one monitor, one mouse. I'll explain the rules of mobbing. I said, and we have six people. It should be five minutes per person, but we'll do four minutes. And even then one person might not get a chance because I said we would only do a 20 minute experiment. And they said, oh, Johanna, this hippy dippy nonsense. They use a different word. And I said, just try it because you're not getting anything through. And in 20 minutes, they actually finished two features. And they said, we have to keep doing this because this is the most productive we've ever been. Now, they don't do it all the time, but they had such a pent up demand for features that when they realized that they could actually finish something and they could all learn from each other and they could finish something faster, that, that changed my mind. So I, I ran it as an experiment, right? My hypothesis was their throughput would be higher I did not, not expect them to finish two features in 20 minutes. That was way out of my expectation. I thought they might kind of get to one, but they were really close on two. So with, with the hive mind, they were able to finish and everybody understood what they were doing. So that's when I became a mobbing convert. All right. Well, and that tallies with what I've read in terms of collective intelligence is um, the two key factors driving collective well first thing to say is the collective intelligence of almost any group is always higher than the, the average and is always higher than the maximum so the collective mm -hmm. is always so the collective is always brighter than even the brightest person and um but the, the two one of the two key drivers of uh the, the the extent of collective intelligence is the is the turn taking so what's the uh the velocity of turn taking and the and the second was the diversity of the team. So it sounds to me like you're you know you're using uh, a range. Like for example, I think they've done it on the Marshmallow game, and they've had groups of CEOs tend to outperform. I do think that they they tend to outperform groups of executive assistants, but the mix of CEOs and executive assistants outperforms both. Right. Um, and gender mix makes a difference as well. Um, mixed mixed gender teams tend to outperform single gender teams. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, but yeah, that would that would be consistent with what you, your hypothesis on modding, mobbing. Yeah. Hmm. So this is, I mean, this is not an easy decision, right? I mean, it goes against everything we train managers to think about, and it goes back to to our earlier conversation, if we optimize for the team, if we optimize up, how can you tell who is doing the best work in a mob? I don't know how you tell that. The team might be able to tell that if, it, if it's a person in four minute or five minute or eight minute turn to be the driver and they have nothing to say and they don't ask for help, then they're not, they're not contributing to the team. But almost all people who, who work in a, in a team like this, in really a tire team or a mob or some kind of a, an accountability where they are accountable to somebody else other than their manager, often show a lot more initiative, show a lot more um, ability to deliver than they do by themselves. And that's, I think that we, we really harm people in many ways um, when we do, when we criminalize asking for help. 
And too often, we make asking for help something you can be knocked down on your performance review for. When in reality, asking for help is almost the best thing you can do. So I have, I have ducks. I have many ducks. Um, you've heard, you've seen my talk to the duck, right? And That's Joanna lift for those listening, holding up. Oh yeah, duck. I, That's I, cool. this this actually was given to me by a lovely guy in from Amsterdam. I have one from Alaska here. I have I have many ducks. Um, when we when we articulate when we verbalize our need for help even to a duck that really helps us because it gets out of our head but the best way to ask for help is to ask another human and why should you bang your head against the wall for eight hours and not get anywhere when if you say we have this rule 15 minutes and i ask for help and if you realize that you have to ask for help every 15 minutes, this is not something you can do alone. You need a pair, you need a mob, you need a swarm, you need something else, you need training, right? Don't, don't try and, and cram your head against the wall because the wall doesn't change and it gives you a headache, right? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So we need to change how managers think about teams we need to change how, about how teams think about themselves and that means we have to change the culture and the rewards in the culture i know let's just change all of work yeah well it's surprising isn't it how many uh, companies well is it it's still uh, the, the annual performance review is still the cornerstone right of, of performance management in organizations and um, yeah, and people need thinking. feedback all the time. So mm. why not give people feedback? Why not create an opportunity for feedback at least once a week, a formal opportunity? Mm. Never mind the informal feedback that we give each other all the time. And that, and the other thing, you're, so you're saying that, that, but you're also saying, look at the team, look at the flow of the team. Yeah. So that's so. Yeah, this is where it gets interesting for me. Is so where do we? Where do we focus most of our efforts on developing the individual or analyzing and optimizing the dynamics of the team? Like, what? I'm going to, I'm going to wimp out and say both. So the one-on-ones we have with team members as managers offer insight to what makes people tick. And if a, if a person says, I would really like to learn about Jason or spring or some other IDE or framework I don't even know about, right? Um, then you say, okay, let's put an action plan together and we'll see how you can learn about that. And if they say, I want to understand how, how to work more effectively with people or use my influence, then you put an action plan together for that. Or we need to figure out how to hire um, more in a streamlined fashion, you put an action plan together to work about that, right? That's that's the one-on-one -on -one, um, action plan. If three people tell you they really want to learn about feedback and coaching, now you can put together an action plan for the team, that the team needs learning. And um, you might do this as a lunch and learn every single week or every other week. I, I, I really like a weekly cadence. Maybe you have communities to practice where testers learn about testing techniques and architects learn about architecture techniques and everybody does this, does this for an hour every week or every other week. I mean, if we don't build learning into our teams, we never actually learn more. And there are formal ways of doing it and informal ways of doing it. And the managers see that, right? The ma great managers actually have this perspective because they are not stuck inside the team on the ground doing the work. They are able to take a few minutes and, and look at the team and say, oh, this team really un needs to understand this kind of a thing or that kind of thing. My job as a manager is to arrange a time and a place for learning, and that learning might continue over weeks and might be a one-hour thing. I mean, I, I just finished a virtual leadership workshop with nine managers from one organization, and the idea was for them to all 
get um, organized. What is what is a one-on-one? -on -one? What is feedback? What is coaching? What is delegation? What is servant leadership? What is culture? How do we manage change? And because I, they did that as a cohort, they learned an enormous amount about their about their environment and every person's various challenges for their teams. So the managers were learning and they were teaching their teams. It, it worked out really well. But, that's, but what's interesting here is you focused on the learning of the team and are you almost using that as a proxy for the flow of the team? Or are they distinct conversations? You know, what the term needs, what the team needs to learn, and what the team needs to do to manage its flow. So, if I, if people ask me, what is the one measure you would use to see if an organization is agile? I would talk about throughput in terms of cycle time and lead time. And for, for a team, it's the same thing. What is the team's throughput? And not so much to measure it but to see how can we reduce the friction to getting to allowing the team to get more stuff out. And almost always the friction is not, yeah, there's friction about the build system and friction about automated tests, but it goes back to learning and understanding. What do we need as, as a team to learn and understand to reduce our own friction? How do we get this throughput? And it's almost always a function of somebody doesn't understand. Sometimes it's in the team, sometimes it's um, the, the, the deployment people, but it's almost always a function of learning. So that when people learn individually, yes, they increase their capacity. When they finish their throughput individually, yes, they increase their capacity. And it's even more magnified when the team does it. And it's more magnified when the program does it. And it's more magnified when the team who manages the project portfolio does it. Because then now they're limiting the work of any given team, right? The work in progress for any given team. And they're flowing work through teams and through the system of the organization. So for me, it's turtles on the way down. Okay. And, <laughs> and, 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 so, so your measurement might be the throughput, but almost all, always that's a function of, 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 of understanding of the team. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And if they're blocked in some way, it's, it's, it's because they need to learn something. It's because they need to understand something. And it might be that some, so I have a client who's um, blocked on deployment. Right? I mean, they have a separate deployment group. They want a change control board. I mean, don't even ask, right? I mean, they're stuck in last century with trying to use agile approaches. And so I said, um, I said to them that the team actually had a little bit of a problem with throughput, but mostly the organization has a problem with throughput. And how can they, as an organization, learn enough about anything they want to deploy so they can deploy faster? What would it take for them to learn as an organization? So this, um, I hate to use the term learning organization, but I, I'm wondering if that's the right kind of a term to use. Mm. Well, that's a loaded term, isn't it? Because of the book and it that brings a whole yeah. set of concepts. So it's, yeah. Yeah. It's like calling a new vacuum cleaner a Hoover. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah, but um, I, I think it's, I think it's a, yeah, a, a fascinating point. You know, it's a fascinating idea to me that that's the that's the link, and it makes complete sense. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm just uh, well, I, my my mind's whirring a bit because I'm also <laughs> I'm also thinking about the, the the strong critique from the complexity community, and I'm thinking about. Ralph Stacey and Dave Snowden about the concept of the, the, the learning organization. And right. That's, that's why I hesitate to use that term. But if we don't incorporate learning into everything we do, then we have more friction and our throughput gets lower. So what kind of learning do we need and how do we learn just in time? How do we learn as individuals? So we, we have a team that's kind of a juggernaut 
the team just keeps going. It does not matter what you throw at it. The team understands how to learn and how to deliver and how to keep their throughput up. And how do we do that for collections of teams, which is a program? How do we do that for the people who manage the project portfolio? Because they need to learn also. How do we do this for functional silos? Do we still have functional silos in the organization? What do they need to learn so they can support and, and build on what these cross-functional teams are doing? Um, how do the product owners learn after after I'm done with the geographically distributed agile teams book, I have a product owner book because I see one person cannot do this job. It's not a one person job. The product manager job is not a one person job. So we need a team there. How does the product value team actually create value for all the teams? What do they need to learn as they proceed in their planning and replanning and discovery? I mean, there's a, it, it really does go across and up and down the organization. So I'm not sure everyone, anyone is ever done learning. I certainly am not done learning. So how do we help people learn in the best possible sense? In, in the micro, right, getting feedback about our code and tests with either code reviews or pairing or test reviews or mobbing or something? How do we get feedback about the features we deliver from either the product owner or the, the customer? How do we get feedback about our programs? And I mean, how do we get feedback? If we think about feedback as a vehicle for learning, we might, this might be the right, sort of, sort of the right way to think about it. I'm not sure it's the right way to think about it, but it's a way to think about it. Yeah, I'm certainly the well the, the, the this point about interactions and fee, and if feedback is one of the ways we can think about interactions, then um, sure that's really important, right? And how yeah. do we? And the other thing that we talk a lot about in complexity is this idea of of narrative and what what are the dominant conversations and what are the conversations that are, that are happening and what are the nature of those conversations and yeah what you, you're you're speaking to that to that question here as well yeah mm. great okay it's been a brilliant <laughs> conversation <laughs> you you did not expect your will to turn quite this much did you no no not necessarily no it's um but it's great i think it's and hopefully we've we've taken the listeners on a bit of a journey through the, through this as well um I was going to round out. Yeah, I was going to ask you about some of the other work that you're you're doing and what's coming up, but you you you've already answered that, which is which is fantastic. Um, what, something that m people might be interested in, um, in terms of you personally, or any of these agile. What do you? If I know you've answered this question previously for the interview, and you said sleeping is a big one for you, which you know I'm, I'm with you on that yeah. one. Um, is there anything that you take into your personal daily practice from? from what you write about in terms of agile organizations that you would, you know, that really works for you that you'd like to pass on? So I, I really work hard to limit my work in progress. And that's, I use a personal Kanban board and I worked very, very hard on only working on one thing now and having interim deliverables so I can work on one thing, finish that. So I'm not, I don't have dangly, bits of of stuff hanging around in my head and i then go on to the next thing so uh, we're recording this a week before the agile conference i think i finally finished my my talk for the agile conference about agile only and road mapping i might have i might not i might have to go back I, as i practice it i might refine it a little but i did something like four or five iterations on that talk building it as i went and I, I often discover that when I build as I go, I learn, right? So I use my little deliverable to inform my next bit of planning. It's all feedback. So for me, it's this big loop. So while I might not work in a natural team, I limit my work in progress. I have very small deliverables. I, I can finish two or three, four in a day. Um, I'm not afraid to iterate. 
I, I write like this also. People ask me, how, how can you write so much? And the answer is I don't write that much. I write every day, a thousand, maybe 2000 words a day. So, um, but that only takes me a couple of hours and I know what I wanna write before I sit down to write. I already have the idea. So it's kind of like acceptance criteria, kind of not writing is a little different than a yeah, user story. But I can finish something in anywhere from 15 minutes to one hour. I don't write a thousand words in 15 minutes. Um, that might only be 250 to 500, right? But I can often write a blog post in half an hour. And the hardest part is finding the image. That might take me another half an hour. Yeah. Right. So you chunk it down, right down, you iterate it, you use a Kanban. And for those yeah. who are not, not you're new to the Agile conversation, that's just a, it's a board with your tasks on that you move through a flow. Yeah, and I have I have different sets of so I often have a waiting for a client to get back to me call. <laughs> right. Clients are very interesting. They they call, they have a need, and then they don't get back to you because they're they're making decisions back in their office. So or they're thinking or they're talking. So I have a, a waiting for call back calling and there's a bunch of stuff in there and I have a choice. Do I want to call people or do I want to just let them call me? And it all depends on how much other work I have right now. Right. That's useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And finally, the question I ask all my guests is uh, to you, Johanna Rothman, what does it mean to be human? It means thinking about the all, all the aspects of a human and i am still a work in progress on this i got the mind down really well fuck heart and i am working at the spiritual and i think that they are all connected if people read my create adaptable life blog i think that that's where i have the most intersection of heart mind and spirit and we are all, all of those things. How do we, how do we become the best selves, our, our best selves in, in all of these dimensions? And maybe there are more than three, but I, I kind of like three. So I'll just stick with that. Great. And best place for people to check out your work? jrothman.com j-r-o-t-h-m-a-n.com everything points everything comes off of there awesome well thank you so much for your time thank um, you this was fun good i'm glad you enjoyed it thanks again Hen, joe johanna rossman thank you